Hi, everybody. Welcome to the third virtual seminar in the weekly series. Today, we have a real treat. Back-to-back um, -back talks from the one and only Josh Shavitz from Princeton. Um, first, a tutorial talk, which will build nicely to the research talk. And um, with this, uh, these are going to be the fifth and sixth different talks I've heard Josh give this year out of six different talks. Um, I want to remind you briefly of seminar etiquette and what we anticipate the tutorial format will be. If you have questions, type them into the tutorial window, uh, sorry, into the chat window, and I will moderate and ask Josh your questions if they are burning or he'll get to them in the end. The tutorial, tutorial will be 25 minutes plus five minutes of questions. We'll have a clean break and then go over to the research talk, which will again be 25 minutes plus five minutes of questions. During the talk, type your questions in the chat boxes. And in case we don't get your, get your questions um, during the question and answer session, we will send them over to Josh so he can follow up with you by email. Remember that you can hang out with us and Josh for 15 minutes after the one hour is over. And just so you know, the talk and tutorial are being recorded. Welcome and over to Josh. Okay. Um... So I am going to make a few requests. The first is in the chat window. I put a link to the lecture notes for the tutorial. Feel free to download them so you don't have to write. Um, I'm going to ask all the faculty. I'm going to ask the students to turn their videos on and everyone else to turn their videos off. This first tutorial is meant for graduate students, maybe undergrads. I would like to see your faces. I'm going to ask you for some thumbs up and things. And whether or not the faculty understand or think I'm sort of full of it is not of interest to me. <laughs> so uh, if the faculty could turn their videos off and students could turn their videos on, at least I'll feel like I'm lecturing to actual humans, uh, which is hard in Zoom, but we can do the best that we do. Okay, so I'm gonna share my iPad screen. All right, there's two topics I wanna talk about today. Uh, the first one has to do with uh, nucleation phenomena, particularly nucleation of filaments. Uh, hopefully we will get to that. Shouldn't be a problem. Um, okay. Can everyone see the whiteboard with the squiggly thing? Okay, good. Uh, the second topic has to do with de-wetting of uh, fluids off of cylinders and things, and we will see if we uh, get to that. Uh, if not, at least you have the lecture notes. Um, Okay, so polymers are everywhere inside the cell. Uh, some of them I'm sure you've heard about. We, of course, have cytoskeletal polymers. Uh, you heard about microtubules, I think, in the last session from Tim Mitchinson and others, uh, actin filaments and immediate filaments. Bacteria have these kinds of filaments, at least sort of somewhat related, uh, called MREB and PAR-M and a bunch of things like this. Um, DNA, RNA are also polymers. So many, many uh, macromolecules inside the cells are polymers. And you know you can think about them in lots of different ways. Uh, some of them are homogeneous polymers. All the subunits are the same. Some are heterogeneous. Uh, some form spontaneously in the cell. Some are nucleated. Some are active in that they burn energy as enzymes uh, and burn ATP or GTP. Uh, some are passive. Uh, there's many details, there's much to learn. Um, what I want to do is give a little bit of a sense of some of the underlying physics behind the things that I'll talk about at 1130 or whatever it is. So what do we mean by a polymer or, or, or polym polymerization? Well, we imagine I have little subunits of some polymer floating around. I'm going to talk about homogeneous subunits for this talk. And you know, they're moving all around and vibrating and other funny things uh, like that. And when two of them come together, maybe they stick to each other because they have a binding site like that. And you design this thing so the back and the front maybe polymerize into a line like this. And so that might be what we call a polymer. This, what I draw, is a one-dimensional polymer. You can have two-dimensional polymers, three-dimensional polymers, and we will talk about that in a second. Okay, so this is the generic process that we want to talk about. And uh, we'll focus today on tubulin, which generates microtubules. And I'll usually write these as 
MT for microtubule. And um, tubulin is a GTPase. Okay, so it hydrolyzes GTP. This is not important for polymerization and assembly. This is important for depolymerization, um, uh, 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 the stochastic switch between growing and shrinking, these catastrophe events. Uh, many polymers in the cell are active in that their enzymes and burn energy. And this is for reasons of control. If you just let thermodynamics passively control you, you have very little ability as a cell to modulate, let's say, the equilibrium length or the location of polymerization, stuff like that. And so the enzymatic activities are there to add some sense of semblance of control. And microtubules uh, don't use that energy conversion as part of the polymerization reaction. They use it as a part of the uh, depolymerization reaction, uh, you might say. Okay. Uh, I've lost my chat window. Where did the chat window go? Let's see. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, what we're going to be talking about uh, then seeing as it's not an inactive process is what's usually called the equilibrium polymer. Okay. And uh, by this, we mean that the, the binding reactions are going to be all in equilibrium. So if I start with two monomers and I put them together to make... Uh, a dimer like this, I could write that kinetic reaction as, let's say, the concentration uh, of monomers. And so I have two monomers that have to come together, and they then will make a dimer. So I'll write that as A sub 2. This will have an off rate and an on rate, and I'm going to make these functions of uh, the order of the polymer that I'm adding to. So here I'm taking a monomer and adding a monomer to it. So that'll be K on one and K off one. That then will have an equilibrium constant, capital K, which is the ratio of the on rates and the off rates. So K also has to have an index um, like that. And at equilibrium, of course, this will be equal to the concentration of dimers divided by the concentration of monomers. And so this will go down. Uh, 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 sort of the line as I polymerize, so I will have an N sized polymer. I'm then going to add a monomer to it, and that's going to make an N plus one sized polymer. And so that reaction then is A sub N plus A sub one. I have K on of N. K off of N goes to A N plus one. And this will give me an equilibrium constant for the N polymerization reaction, K on of N over K off of N, which is gonna be the concentration of A N plus one divided by the product of the concentration of N times the concentration of one. So the, the intricacies, the details, the uh, biological magic has to do with this N dependence of these rates, or equivalently, the N dependence of this equilibrium constant. Okay, so you can design uh, different systems to have a different N dependence, and that's going to give rise to a different general behavior for this polymerization reaction of a whole, as a whole. Okay, so let's think about. Uh, a couple a couple things. So uh, the, the first, the easiest thing to think about is called the isodesmic polymer. Okay, and that's just one where all the k's are equal. All the equilibrium constants are equal. Okay, so this is uh, obviously rather boring. It's also essentially impossible to design because if you think about the entropic changes that happen with polymerization, I have two monomers, I bring them together. That involves both an enthalpic change and an entropic change. Once I have a long polymer, when I bring that monomer from solution onto the long polymer, it greatly reduces the configuration space for that monomer. And so the entropy changes are a steep function of the length of the polymer. And so because of that, 
essentially you always have a rather steep change of the equilibrium constant as a function of the length of the column. So the, the next kind of simplest model that people often do um, is they assume that there's a separation of time scales for polymerization of a nucleus. So we'll say that the first few um, equilibrium constants up to some index n star are going to be equal to each other and equal to some nucleation equilibrium constant, where n star is the size of the nucleus, the number of monomers you have to bind to make the nucleus. And then all the other uh, higher order equilibrium constants have a different equilibrium constant. And nucleation is going to be much slower than elongation. Okay, so essentially you sit around all day waiting to form a nucleus to bring these n star um, uh, monomers together, and after that you go and you polymerize really quickly. Okay, and in this model, you essentially have a, a one step reaction where you're waiting for n star of these guys to get together, then there's some sort of effective rate that has to do with the time scale of that, and that produces this n star size nucleus that's then polymerization competent. So if you're to look at the rate at which you nucleate, the, way, the rate at which, say, you make polymers, okay, that's going to be this effective uh, nucleation, uh, this effective rate constant times the concentration of monomers, which I'll write as C, to the n star power, because I need n star of them to come together at once. And so the way you usually measure this in an experiment is you make a log log plot of R versus the log of C. That will give you some kind of straight line. And the slope then gives you the size of the nucleus, OK, in this very simple model. Now, Maybe you're saying, wait, I don't like that model. That's much too simple. Uh, Josh says, this separation of time scales is crazy. You assumed all the nucleation reactions are equivalent. That's not cool. OK, great. So let's try something slightly more complicated. Let's write down a master equation now for uh, different polymers of size n. So I'm going to have uh, this sort of field, which I'll index with m, which is a concentration of polymers the size of n at time t. And I just keep track of all the different polymers in some sense. The rate that m changes then for uh, the nth um, sized uh, polymer is, well, I can add on to a filament of size n minus 1. That will give me a filament of size n. So that's going to be C times the n minus 1 on rate times the concentration uh, of n minus 1 sized polymers. If I add on a monomer to my n sized polymer, that becomes an n plus 1 sized polymer. And so that's no longer an n sized polymer. So I have to subtract C times k on of n times the current concentration of n sized polymers. Then I can become an n size polymer by losing a monomer from an n plus 1. So that's k off times m of t n plus 1. And I lose an n size polymers by falling off and becoming an n minus 1 size polymer. So that'll be k off of n, m of t, comma n. And I think I have that all written correctly. OK. So at equilibrium, we have a detailed balance. So the forward rates and the backward rates for each of these steps, n to n plus 1, et cetera, uh, are all the same. So that I can write that the on rate of going uh, from n minus 1 let me write it like this. is going to be equal to the off rate of coming off of an n size polymer. 
Okay, and so what I have here now, this MEQ is the equilibrium distribution of polymers of different size n. And they're related to each other by these kinetic factors, K on n minus one and K off of n. Okay, and in equilibrium, we can write this distribution as a Boltzmann distribution so that the equilibrium distribution of polymers of size n is gonna be the monomer concentration. Everything scales with how much stuff, essentially total, that I put inside uh, of this. Uh, someone just asked, C is the concentration of monomers times a Boltzmann factor with a free energy function that's a function of n, the polymer size. Okay, when I do this in the limit that n is continuous, my master equation becomes a diffusion equation in the potential described by the free energy G. So if you go through some math, which I won't go through here, uh, you will discover that dm dt is gonna be C times the on rate, times the nth derivative, and then inside I'm gonna have partial m, partial n, plus one over kt, times partial g, partial n, which gives me a forcing in n, uh, times m. Okay, so now I've converted this problem, which looked like a complicated coupled master equation, into a diffusion equation, where I diffuse around in a potential described by g. Okay, so what is G? Um, I'm gonna go through uh, not everything in the lecture notes. You're welcome to download them from the link that I put in the chat and see a little bit more. In general, you can write down G as uh, a function that is usually thought of as a surface function. It's a function of N and it has to do with, let's say that uh, you don't want to expose the monomers to the fluid as much, so there's an effective surface tension. This could be a surface energy term. If you have a conformational change that has to happen in order to make a polymerization a competent nucleus, this would go into that factor as well. Importantly, it's not dependent on the concentration. It has to do with like, I build this funny nucleus and then it wants to be maybe in a different shape where it's hard to make it in the right shape to polymerize a microtubule for example, and then I subtract from that term, which is sort of all these little micro details, a term that has to do with the binding energy or the chemical potential for binding any monomer to the polymer. And so if I have n monomers in there, I get n factors of this energy, the chemical potential. Okay. So when I do that, usually what happens, as you can see in the notes if you want, S of n is gonna be an increasing function of n, okay? And n delta mu is obviously a decreasing function of n. And so, for example, for a two-dimensional polymer, if you're thinking about surface tension, S of n goes like the square root of n, which is faster than linear for small n and uh, slower than linear otherwise. And so what you get when you add those two functions and you plot the free energy as a function of n, is you're gonna get a free energy that looks something like this. It's a free energy that has a barrier. So you start at n equals zero, and this free energy is keeping you small. You try to build something and it pushes you back until you reach this peak here, which is at a value of n star. It's the most unstable uh, aggregate size of these monomers until you reach there, and then you have a forcing that makes the polymers grow long and it go longer, and this is, this is the process of nucleation, okay? What I've just described to you is really very general. It has to do with nucleation of lots and lots of things, not just polymers and stuff like that. So if you go through uh, in the notes, you'll see that in this model, independent of the, of the, the um, form for S of N, as long as it's not concentration dependent, you will also find that the rate of nucleation goes like the concentration to the end power the n star power. Okay, so even if you don't have this very simple separation of time scales argument, etc., you still get this scaling to happen. Okay. Uh, 
maybe, let me see if I can finish this and then I'll answer the next uh, question that came up. So, okay, so the next, the, the other phenomenon I wanted to talk to, talk to you guys about uh, is, is a, a fluid-based uh, phenomenon called the Raleigh Plateau instability or the Plateau Raleigh instability, or it has many names. And, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of names, but uh, we'll use them anyway. Okay. Okay, so I have a few numerical things um, written out uh, uh, in their basic, basic arguments about why this phenomena will happen. I'm just going to give you one very quick one here because I only have a few minutes. I encourage you to go read those. Uh, if you're really interested in this, what I really encourage you to do is go read um, John Bush from MIT has a series of lecture notes on surface tension-based phenomena. I think there's different versions of it. It's from a class he's taught many, many times. There's even an open course where or whatever it is one. Uh, they are truly fantastic. Uh, if you really want to know how to think about this stuff, go read those. They are totally amazing. So the question is, what happens if I have a stream of fluid sitting there? Okay, something, something like water. Okay, well, if I make a small perturbation to the shape of this fluid, let me start by putting a sine wave on it, which I don't know if I drew very well. Okay, we know, um, that the young Laplace equation tells me that if I have a surface tension, so the water would really like to be in droplets and not dissolved out into the air at room temperature, that if I have a surface tension, I get a pressure difference that is proportional to the curvature of the surface. So I have some curved surface. I can make a little normal vector from the curved surface. I look at how that normal vector changes in space. And if the front is curved, that induces a pressure difference. Okay, and so this is going to be something like gamma um, divided by the mean uh, radius of curvature. So when we look at this red shape I drew over here, this region has high curvature, higher than out here, and therefore it has higher pressure. The bulge regions have lower curvature and therefore lower pressure. And so the fluid here is going to be driven from the regions of high pressure to the regions of low pressure. And the bulges will grow and the little dips will narrow and I will break this column of fluid up into droplets. This is why when you turn your faucet on, it doesn't stay as a cohesive column, it breaks up the droplets and things like that. Okay, so I think I'm supposed to stop according to Sri. Uh, I encourage you to read, if you're interested in, in some more details, look at the lecture notes. Um, if you really are interested in fluids, go read the Bush notes on surface tension effects. Uh, he's done many interesting things. Insects that can walk on water, insects that can curve, specifically curve fluid fronts that give it uh, a motion and things like this. It's quite fantastic stuff. I encourage you to read about that. Uh, the nucleation phenomenon, there's much, much, much written everywhere. Uh, you know, most of it in the chemistry literature, but kind of all over. A lot of it is very specific models. I sort of like the viewpoint that we talked about today um, because it sort of shows you that this is a generic phenomenon. And yes, of course, you need to put in details, but the physics is quite generic and this essentially will almost always happen uh, no matter what you do. Okay, and with that, I think we're gonna take a five minute break. Uh, yeah, are there any, there was one question, uh, where did it go? From Olivia, I, I can read it to you. Can you repeat the reason for the instability at high concentrations again? Uh, Olivia, can you unmute and, and uh, ask it maybe? On your previous slide, you had the graph on the free energy and like the high number of monomers and then it exponentially decreases. Can you explain why? This, this, ah, okay, so all I did is I said uh, G is S of N minus N delta mu. And so if S of N is, for example, a square root function, it's something like that. And then I have to subtract from that this. Okay. And you just add those together. Good? Yeah, thank you. you. Okay, great. All right. Um, any Let's take a five minute break and then we will return for the other lecture. Um, 
Um, everybody, you have a chance to ask more questions. If not, Josh, you, can, you also have a chance to tell us things you didn't tell. Uh, there are calculations. I, I, I don't think getting in the calculations is going to be particularly insightful or a good use of time. Uh, so. Okay. okay. So are there burning questions then? If not, we'll take a collective stretching slash bathroom break and return at 11.30. Josh is here if you change your mind and ask, want to ask a question. I'll be back in 60 seconds. <laughs> Okay, faculty are allowed to turn their videos on if they want, but then they have to stop reading their email while I talk. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. <laughs> uh, hey, Josh. Josh G. Great to see you. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? Okay, we miss you, dude. Definitely. Uh, not to jump in, but Josh, you have a real question. Um, from Gabor. Um, one question, is the form of SFN heuristic? Any mechanisms? Yeah, so the square root function, if you, if you say it's about surface tension, you have a surface tension term times the surface area. The surface area is going to scale like n to the d minus 1 over d power. So you can do two, three dimensions. Uh, but you can put other functions in. So for example, the, the microtubule stuff I'll talk about, I mean, we don't know what the function is, but it's not a surface energy term. It has to do with uh, some complicated conformational changes that are going to happen. And, you know, that'll have some other function. The, the only important thing is that it's not a dependent on the monomer concentration. It's sort of about the, the nucleus aggregate itself and not about addition of stuff from the outside. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Robin. Hi, I have a question for Josh. Yeah. Um, did you consider the possibility that the polymer can like break in the middle? I didn't see that. No, I didn't, I didn't put that that in. That certainly can happen. Uh, most biopolymers, that's not a, I mean, yes, of course, the details get interesting uh, when you would like, but that's not often how you see actin in microtubules, for example, depolymerizing or polymerizing Sometimes under stress, yes, you can snap things. Okay, I remember seeing this under the category of living polymers. Is this the same? Is well, that so what this is? What I did was at equilibrium. Nothing I said was particularly biological uh, in, in that treatment. Once you add the enzymatics, lots of things. So there are enzymes that cut microtubules, right? They burn energy to do so. All of that is way out of equilibrium and something totally different. And, if you wanted the actual master equation for microtubules, it would be very, very long. Uh, I, I don't recommend it, something we should try to write down, frankly. So when, when we teach classical nucleation theory, we often show that there's a maximum in 3D and 2D, but if you neglect that entropy term in 1D, then there's no barrier to nucleation in 1D. Correct. That's in and the so, I didn't get to talk about that. Okay, but then the question is, if we added that entropy term to the 2D and the 3D case, I wonder if it would change classical nucleation theory in some interesting way. I never really thought about it. So No, enough. that's in there. That's in the chemical potentials. Okay. The, it, 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 a true 1D polymer does not, cannot have a barrier. So, uh, question from a student. Um, is it always a monomer being added or can other be connected? For microtubules and actin, basically yes. 
So uh, in other systems, this of course is not generically true, but it appears to be true for most of these biopolymer processes. You don't really see lots of annealing of things. The, the microtubule is kind of most easy to see why that would be hard is, is I'm not sharing my title. Maybe I should share, share my title slide. Um, give me a second here. Problem is I can't see all you guys once I, can you see my slides now? Yes. Yeah, so right, the microtubule is this, this round polymer and the edge of it is a little jagged. And so if you were to anneal two microtubules, you'd have to have the interfaces match and you know, that seems kind of tricky uh, to do in some sense. Okay, I'm, now I need to make my chat come over here. Okay, well I can see the chat now, but I can no longer see your shining awesome faces. I apologize. <laughs> Regardless, in the interest of time, shall we transition to your research talk now? Sure. Go for it. Oh, okay, that, great. Uh, where is my... So hi, okay. everybody, again. Here is Josh, part two. Over to you, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, hold on. I want to uh, turn on the little spotlighty thing. Okay, can you see the mouse with a little red dot on it? I'm gonna take that as a yes, but I can't see anybody's face. Okay, yes. um, so, all right. So today in this sort of brief time that I have, I wanna talk about uh, some very recent work that uh, has been happening uh, is a collaboration between my group, uh, the group of Sabina Petri and the group of Howard Stone. Uh, it's really a wonderful, one of these wonderful organic collaborations that just kind of magically appears when a new wonderful person comes to campus, which was Sabina uh, several years ago. And it's just been really, really fun. Uh, and this is, of course, not driven by us. This is driven by the students. And so the work I'm going to talk about today really has been um, a fantastic group of work uh, done by Akansha Thawani, Bernardo Gouveia, and Sagar Setru, uh, all of whom are somehow jointly advised in two or three way joint advising arrangements, and it's just been totally fantastic. Um, I, of course, cannot tell you nearly everything that they even they have done in the last couple of years, uh, but these three recent papers uh, have a lot of the details in them. Uh, I'll put the references up at the end again, uh, so I encourage you to go um, um, look at those uh, if you're interested in more in what we're talking about. I will also say that not two and a half hours ago, Akansha defended her thesis, so she is now a uh, doctor uh, Thawani, so we're very, very, very excited, and it was essentially a part of what I'm talking about today. It was only a small part of what she actually did for her PhD. Okay, so the microtubule cytoskeleton obviously does many, many things. I think you've heard from other speakers in this series about uh, what the microtubule cytoskeleton can do. I won't talk too much about all these functions. I will remind you the microtubule is a polymer. It's a rather complex polymer. It's essentially a 2D sheet wrapped into a long uh, hollow cylinder. The monomeric subunits of that are actually dimers of a protein called tubulin, which makes talking about it really rather cumbersome. Uh, anyway, if I call them monomers, I do know they're dimers, but what are you gonna do? Uh, and they self-assemble into these long uh, cylinders that on average have about 13 of these protofilaments, uh, these sort of vertical stripes along the, the axial stripes along the, the microtubule. Uh, on average, they're straight. If you do funny things to them, or even just on average, sometimes they polymerize into other configurations, which is fun. We won't talk uh, at all about uh, how that works. The thing I wanted to impress upon you first is that there's really an incredible number of microtubules uh, that you have to make in your body. Uh, you undergo about 10 to the 15th cell divisions total in your life. Each one has 100,000 microtubules per the mitotic spindle that it makes. That's not even all the microtubules you have. So that makes at least 10 to the 20th microtubules that you have to make in your entire life. Okay, and so you imagine, okay, I don't know, uh, then I just need a lot of tubulin. So I throw a crap ton of tubulin uh, inside the cell and it just makes lots of microtubules. But the problem with that, of course, is you don't want microtubules everywhere. You want them in specific places, like in this mitotic spindle or something like that. And so why don't microtubules uh, polymerize everywhere? And the answer is that uh, they have to nucleate first. And so if you look at a concentration series, so th this is the kinds of images I'll show several of in this talk. Uh, we're looking, in this case, at a block surface. We're looking at fluorescently labeled microtubules and just asking at different concentrations of, of uh, tubulin, alpha-beta tubulin, uh, how many microtubules do I see? 
And what you find is that it's not a linear dependence. Uh, it's quite a steep dependence after you reach sort of a threshold uh, a concentration or a critical concentration for nucleation of about 14 micromolars. And if you measure the slope of this log R versus log C plot that we talked about in the tutorial talk, you find that it has an N star or a nuclear size of eight uh, of these tubulin subunits. So it has to make a pretty uh, substantial nucleus before it can make a, a polymerization competent microtubule. And this 14 micromolar value, the, the value at which microtubules start to polymerize, is substantially larger than the cellular concentration uh, of tubulin. This has a squiggly line. There's different sorts of estimates, but none of them are as high as 14 micromolar. So you have a lot of tubulin available, but it's at too low a concentration to kinetically form the nucleus and then, um, and then you know, form microtubules. So what actually happens in your cell is essentially every microtubule born in your cell is templated and nucleated by this set of proteins called the gamma tubulin ring complex. So in addition to alpha beta tubulin, there's another kind of tubulin your body makes called gamma tubulin. I sort of drew it in this dark blue. And gamma tubulin binds to alpha beta tubulin and it lives in these little kind of cone-shaped complexes called the gamma tubulin ring complex that have a bunch of other proteins in them. And that makes uh, an arrangement of gamma tubulins that looks like the very first row of a microtubule. And so the idea then is that alpha beta tubulins are then templated by this. This essentially looks like a nucleus and that's what uh, uh, allows you to nucleate microtubules inside the cell at, at lower concentrations. You can overcome the nucleation barrier. That, that's sort of been the idea since these gamma tubulins uh, uh, were, were discovered. And if you look at where microtubules actually polymerize in the cell, you have the centrosome, which is the base of the spindle. There's lots of microtubules there. And if you look at the centrosome, it's essentially decorated very heavily with these gamma tubulin ring complexes. Then you have the generation of branch microtubules, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and those also have gamma tubulin, this little triangle thing at the base of the branches. So this thing is really the action, and no one had really been able to see it happening directly until Kongshu did a series of experiments uh, just this past couple of years. So she's been able to purify competent gamma tubulin and come up with a completely in vitro assay for studying uh, uh, microtubule nucleation. So in this movie, we have gamma tubulins labeled in green, the little dots. Tubulin is gonna be in red. The, the microtubules are going to grow. And if you watch carefully, for example, at this one with the white arrow, you will see the microtubules emerge from the green spots. So the gamma tubulins are nucleating the microtubules at their end. They actually stay down to what's called the negative uh, 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 side polarity of the microtubule. That's not important for this talk. We like to think about that. They hang on there, and then only the plus end is what is going to polymerize away from it. And you can see that, for example, in this chymograph, this uh, green gamma turk sat here, and then a microtubule emerged from it. Okay, if you then do a concentration series of um, uh, tubulin and ask now what does the critical uh, nuclea nucleation concentration and nuclear size look like, you can see that they've been changed from what they are when you just have raw tubulin. The critical concentration is dropped to seven micromolar from 14 micromolar and the nucleus size is now four, give or take, uh, compared to eight. Okay. So this is still not enough to help us in the cell. We have to go one step further, but this at least tells us the molecular mechanism via which a gamma tubulin or gamma turf nucleate microtubules. So we wanted to know more about this nucleus size or transition state. And so we did a series of Monte Carlo simulations uh, that have six parameters, all of which we can measure in experiment. Four of them we can measure directly in experiment, other kinds of experiments. Two of them we have to fit to the kinetic data. And uh, they involve one aspect of gamma tubulin I haven't told you, and some very recent structural work has shown that gamma tubulin, when it's not bound to a microtubule, is actually a little bit too open. The gamma tubulin subunits are farther apart than they should be for a microtubule on the gamma turf, and actually they're kind of pointed in slightly the wrong way. Okay, so, there, so in order to polymerize a microtubule off of the gamma turf, you have to close it up into a shape that's uh, uh, sufficient for polymerization. This would be the net S of N term we talked about 
in the tutorial. And so that's represented by this energy, delta G confirmation, or whatever you want to call it. Then the other energies in the problems have to do with the, the longitudinal and lateral association of the alpha betas to each other and the alpha betas to a gamma tubulin in the gamma chart. And those we can measure uh, uh, using uh, um, biochemical measurements. And if you want to read in that paper, or the ELI paper, you can see that. Then there's a couple rates and we fit that to the kinetic data. So what you have is you run one of these simulations, you can see that a few subunits will bind to the gamma turk and come off and on until you reach a critical nucleus size and then microtubule polymerization takes off and you have lots and lots of microtubule growth uh, on this thing. If you look at the statistical properties of what these nucleus size were, what is the configuration that became polymerization tolerant, you find that there's a number of species. So this is an interesting histogram. Uh, each of these points is a different number of lateral uh, alpha beta associations and a different number of total alpha beta subunits on the gamma turf. And these are the most, uh, uh, um, the, the most populated species in these simulations. Uh, the most common critical nucleus is four monomers touching each other in three contacts sitting at some place uh, on the gamma turk, but there's a few other configurations that also give rise uh, to, to, to polymerization, all of which uh, involve trading off lateral association energy between alpha beta, alpha beta tumulins and the energy it takes to close up uh, uh, the gamma turk complex. Okay, so th this gamma turk brought down the critical concentration to seven micromolar, which is still not low enough uh, to give you uh, microtubules in the cell, but there's several ways around this as we'll talk about. And one is that there's accessory factors that modulate, uh, we think, the local concentration essentially of tubulin near the gamma turk, although I think we have some more work to do on that. If you have just gamma turk and you look at what happens with seven micromolar tubulin, you get a very, very small number of microtubules. If instead you also have this accessory factor called XMAP215, then at, at seven micromolars, you have lots and lots uh, of, of microtubules present. And then here's a really nice experiment. Now we have gamma turks in blue. I apologize, the colors have changed here. XMAP, the accessory factor is in red. The microtubules will be green. And what you see is this one factor on the lower left. I wish that would go away. Hmm. Let's make this thing go away. Okay, you can see the XMAP comes on and off and on and off. And eventually when it comes on, it sticks there and a the microtubule grows. Uh, off of that function. And using our simulations, we've been able to show that this is consistent uh, with increasing the alpha, beta, alpha, beta um, associated en energies and the gamma alpha, beta. So essentially, uh, um, the longitudinal associ association energies in the problem by about 20%. And you can get this reduction in the critical concentration for nucleation. But importantly, you don't change the nucleus size really very much. It's more or less just increasing the concentration. Okay, so in the cell, branching occurs at the centrosome, and it seems to occur, uh, microtubule birth and nucleation seem to occur a lot near the chromosomes. There seems to be two different mechanisms for this, uh, for reasons that at least I don't understand, but have been shown. There's a very, very high concentration of monomer, uh, tubulin monomers, or alpha-beta dimers, uh, the subunits of, uh, of microtubules, near the centrosomes. Uh, and it's not clear to me this is understood, but um, it appears to be true, and so this raises the concentration above the, 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 the critical uh, concentration for nucleation on gamma turf. Near the microtubule, something else is happening. Um, what happens is you have uh, XMAP and all these things present, so you should be able um, to, to nucleate, but branching nucleation requires a different protein uh, called TPX2, which is going to localize the gamma turk to the microtubules. And that protein is essentially in an inactive form throughout the cell. It's kind of sequestered by a series of proteins. And that sequestering is relieved by the presence of RAN GTP, so GTP round RAN. The chromosomes themselves have uh, nucleotide exchange factors that convert the GDP form to the GTP form. So what you get in the end then is a gradient of RAN GTP, that gives you a, a gradient of this TPX2 protein, which then localizes branch nucleation. 
So you get a lot of nucleation at the centrosome because you have lots of tubulin concentration. You get a lot of nucleation in the vicinity of the chromosome because you have this uh, gradient of this required TPX2 molecule, which we're going to talk about. Okay, so one a dramatic example of this, so Sagar did an experiment. He's been doing these really crazy experiments where he purifies all sorts of things and labels them in all different colors. So here, this sort of gray color is the chromatin. Uh, the blue color is a kinetochore pair. In red, you're going to see tubulin and microtubules. In green, you're going to see the microtubule plus ends. And you'll see a microtubule grows near the chromosome. It branches a little bit. And because branching is the geometric process, the branching grows exponentially, and you get really insane amounts of microtubules that are born from the chromosome itself because of this branching. Okay, so we know something about the order uh, 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 of the binding of all these different proteins. Um, so if you flow in TPX2, let it bind the microtubule, flow it out, and then flow in the other stuff, the augment, gamma turk, that sort of thing, you'll get branches. If you flow in the augments and other stuff first, flow it out and add TPX2, you don't get any branching. So it's the sequential thing where TPX2 is the required first step on the microtubule for making a, a new microtubule branch. And when you look at this TPX2 at very high concentrations, you discover, lo and behold, it phase separates into droplets. More on that in a second. And in fact, that those droplets bind along the microtubule, and those droplets are where new branches, new microtubule branches emerge. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Many proteins, when you put them at very high concentration, uh, phase separate into a liquid-liquid phase separation thing, and this is all the rage these days. And, and you thought you would get away with hearing a talk that didn't have it in it. And I will tell you that this is true. This is at very high concentration, and it forms these things. What about physiological concentrations, which are much, much lower of this TPX2, okay, orders of magnitude lower? Well, when you do that, what you see is that the TPX2 looks uniform along the microtubule. You don't see droplets anymore. Okay, so sad, sad. Uh, um, we don't have our liquid-liquid phase separation phenomenon anymore. But what if it's making droplets that are just too small to see with fluorescence microscopy? So we went to a different technique, which is AFM topography. So you take an AFM cantilever and you essentially map it over uh, by tapping over all points on the substrate. And that's what this image on the lower left is. This is a height image and you can see the microtubules. Those are these big long white things. And we're going to play a movie where we now flow in TPX2. So the heights all got bigger because it coated the microtubule. And then if you look carefully, what happens over time is you seem to develop bulges along the microtubule. So in this uh, heat map here, we have different time points. So that's the initial microtubule. It's about 25 nanometers. Then we flow in the TPX2. It makes the height go up to about 40 something nanometers. And then you can see that initially pretty uniform coating breaks up into a series of bulges, both in the XY direction and in the Z direction. If you look at a line scan through that, you see it even more dramatically. You can see we get the height of the microtubule at 25 nanometers, no problem. We know exactly that's what it is. You flow in the TPX2 and you get this blue line. It's very flat. And then over time, as a matter of tens of minutes, you see it breaks up into this quite sinusoidal looking uh, oscillation in heights that looks quite periodic. You can see this periodicity by uh, looking at a power spectrum of this height signal, and you see that there's a clear peak in the power spectrum, in this case, at 260 nanometers, okay, which is basically below the, the resolution limit that we had in the optical microscopy, and so that's why it looked uniform to us. Now, we know a bit about fluid layers that like to break up into droplets. This is called the Rowley plateau instability. It what's, it's what makes the fluid that comes out of your faucet break up, break up into droplets. Uh, it also happens if you have a fluid that's coating a solid cylinder, the same phenomenon happens. And just to give you a little bit uh, of a demonstration, here is Sager pulling a wire in a very viscous uh, substance. And he pulled it fast here, which made a very thick fluid film around the wire. And he pulled it slowly here, which made a thinner uh, fluid film. And you can see the thinner fluid film gave rise to smaller, more closely spaced droplets. And the thicker one gave rise uh, uh, to larger, uh, more spread out droplets of this fluid. So in general, you have a prediction that the droplets, droplet spacing should be a function of the height, the thickness of this fluid film. And in fact, this is a purely geometric prediction. I had some of this in the tutorial notes for those of you who are interested. 
this, the, the, the viscosity, the actual surface tensions, what the fluid is made of doesn't matter. It's a geometric prediction that you should have. This. So we went and we measured this. If you put more TPX2 in, you get thicker films, it turns out. So we can change the film thickness from about uh, 10 or so nanometers to 20 something nanometers. And you can see that we see an increasing trend, just like the theory predicts. Theory has no free parameters, doesn't uh, fit quite perfectly. Uh, we think we understand that. That's because the theory corresponds to a fluid cylinder that's completely wrapped around the microtubule, but our microtubule is sitting on a surface uh, that has slightly less volume. And so if you put in a correction for that, you do much better uh, than we would have done before. Okay, so that's where microtubules go. They go to the droplets, they're originating there. Why is this important? I can think of two reasons why this might be an interesting phenomenon. The first is this spaces out the branch points. I think that there, there could be an argument that you would like to space out branching and not have it all be uh, sort of exponentially distributed along the microtubule. The other is that in the TPX2 fluid, we've been able to show that uh, other proteins diffuse around at a higher local concentration than they do in the bulk. Okay, so tubulins, uh, augmins, the other proteins that are necessary for branching are diffusing around in there. And if you do a calculation or a simulation of the time it takes for the co-aggregation of different proteins, if they're diffusing in a, in a cylindrical fluid versus a droplet fluid, you see that the droplets enhance uh, uh, the time. They lower the time it takes uh, to get the branching factors uh, to come all together, given the same volume of that TPX2 fluid. Another thing I'll point out is if you look in the literature, people have been seeing these aggregated droplets along uh, uh, cellular filaments uh, for quite some years. It's not uh, clear that they necessarily appreciate the mechanism behind it, but I, I think this Raleigh plateau instability uh, governing um, the localization of some of these factors on cytoskeletal filaments could be quite general, uh, and thus, thus is pretty interesting. Okay, Sri has told me I'm basically out of time. So I will end here. These are the three groups. The only group picture I could find of Howard's lab doesn't have Howard in it. I, sorry, Howard. A country sent me this yesterday. Um, again, this, is, this has been a really fun project. It's a collaboration between a bunch of different groups who think about things in different levels, and it's just been super fun. Uh, if you're interested in more details, please see uh, these three papers. Uh, this one about the ordering of branching and, and the geometry uh, of branch networks. Uh, the Gamma Turk story is in this middle one, and the de-wetting story I just told you is in this uh, bottom one here. Uh, these are our funding things. I would also like to take my last minute to say that this story was brought to you completely by immigrants and first and second generation uh, families of immigrants uh, who came to this country and have clearly made this country a better place. You should all go vote in November if you're able. Uh, please do so. And with that, I will end and take some questions. Super. Thanks, Josh. I am going to read you a selection of questions, uh, starting with one from Modas on during the early nucleation elongation process, are the values of K on for addition of monomers to ol oligomers of different lengths the same? If not, how different are they? Say that again. Sorry. So this, <laughs> this corresponds to one of your slides. During the early nucleation elongation process, are the values of K on for addition of monomers to olig oligomers of different lengths the same? If not, how different are they? Are the K ons the same or how different are they? Oh, uh, after nucleation, they appear to be basically the same. I guess I was asking how stable is your nucleus, you know, like is your initial nucleus quite stable or does it have to become a little bit bigger because it's before it's stable? In the simulations, uh, they're really quite stable. And in the experiments? I mean, all we have are the scaling plots. Okay. Right? I mean, you don't see the nucleus. So, okay. um, but in the simulations, given the delta G's we measure from experiments, um, it's quite, they're, they're pretty stable. I mean, you, you saw like the second most common nucleus was the most common one plus one monomer. And there were just a couple things like that. And then everything else dropped off in probability. So in the simulation, it's, you know, I, the exponential with delta G is, is very steep. This is the secret to many things. And that, that's also in that. Okay, thank you. 
Um, next one from Olivia. Is there a biochemical basis for the favorability of tubulin binding to gamma tubulin at specific sites? Sorry, I'm bad at listening and better at reading. Uh, Olivia at 1142. Is there one thing for the favorability of two? Uh, define specific sites, Olivia. Uh, on one of your slides, you had a probability distribution of the way the alpha beta tubulin orients itself when it binds to the gamma tubulin, and there was like specific peak probabilities depending on where it bounds. Oh, yeah. So, so that plot came from simulations. It was just saying when we do the simulations, when you take off the nucleation or in polymerization, what did the structure look like? And that those are what the structures look like. The the delta G's for alpha, alpha beta, alpha beta, alpha beta, alpha beta, alpha beta, gamma, it, those are constants independent of the, the, the local configuration. Okay, thank you. Next one from Nancy Ford. I'm just reading it for the benefit of the YouTube video later. Does the gamma turk close cooperatively all subunits together or each independently? So this is not known. Our model has it being completely cooperative, like you're open or you're closed. Uh, I mean, I will say when we submitted this paper originally, those structures went out and then they came out in review and everyone said, wait a minute, like the thing has to like do this. And we're like, oh, dumb, crap, you know. So um, I don't think that's known. Um, so I'll leave, it. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Uh, next from Purnima at 1143. It looks like the gamma turk is a staircase. Does it matter where on the staircase the nuclei occur or does it only, or does only the number appear to matter? Yeah, this is, this is an excellent question. I glossed over these details. Um, I actually don't think I know the answer to this, but it's in the simulation. So the, the, the normal microtubule, the 13 protofilament, happy straight protofilament microtubule has a seam in it in that if you go around subunit by subunit, at some point there's a break. So there's this weird seam in the microtubule. That seam is also present in the gamma, uh, in the gamma torque complex. So that's in the simulation, as you saw. Your question is, is the nucleus sort of maybe disfavored from being near that? Uh, my guess is yes, it's definitely in the data. I don't think I ever asked a conscious specifically that. It's a very good question. I'll, uh, if you'd like, I can ask her and send you the, the, the answer because it's in the data. We just haven't looked. Uh, jumping to Jing Chen at 11.54. Looks like the model may also predict the variation of droplet-droplet distance as a function of film thickness. Is this also consistent with your experimental data? Um, so the model is really looking at the very initial instability. It's, it's essentially looking at uh, the growth rate for different wavelengths uh, for a very small amplitude and, and does not accurately try to predict, you know, what happens when you eventually form little droplets that are spread out. Uh, so I don't, that model doesn't necessarily predict that. You would imagine though that the larger the wavelength and what you observe in lots of experiments, like when you break up the larger wavelengths, those pinch off into things that are spaced out more and are bigger, both. Um, but the actual model does not have uh, uh, that, that, that in it. Uh, jumping back to Omar Saleh at 1153, um, the question is, can you comment on using continuum liquid pictures in a situation where the film thickness is perhaps not so much larger than the protein size? This is a fantastic Question, I, I have uh, been shocked for a long time that hydrodynamics continues to work, right? I mean, there's experiments that are quite old at this point, looking at actual water with AFMs and things, and fluid dynamic works for water down to a few water molecules. The same appears to be true in these bio contexts. Uh, Howard and I have, have had a number of uh, you know, heated discussions about whether this makes any sense, but. It appears to be true. These continuum arguments just keep working and working uh, uh, for these sort of things. So I, I agree with the, the, the intuition behind your question, but it appears that there's just enough 
re you know, configurational rearrangement on fast time scales that a fluid like picture seems to sort of work, which is amazing to me. So uh, we are at time. Uh, let's officially stop, but we are also starting our informal 15 minute discussion. So those of you who have to take off, Thank you for joining us and making the seminar series a success. And the rest of you, if you don't mind, we'll hang out and take more questions. Um, I, jumped over, uh, I jumped over another question uh, immediately after Omar. Surface curvature is a good measure for water droplets at the macroscopic scale. I wonder whether we can use curvature.